Um, so yeah, I'm Neil Massey. I'm a software engineer at um, Cedar, and I'm going to talk about object storage um, today. Yeah, thank you. So there's a quick overview. Um, so what is an object store? And um, most importantly for users, what does this mean for my workflow? And what tools are available to help with this? And then how does this tie in with other services? So for context, this is the slide we've all been showing. And this uh, object store is obviously a storage service. So um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so uh, what is a object store or object storage? Um, so it's a computer storage architecture in which objects are they're stored in a flat structure. There's, there's no, um, there's a very flat um, hierarchy to it. So uh, the objects, they're identified by a key which is um, usually a URL. Um, objects are organized into buckets, um, but that's the only kind of hierarchy and organization there is to it. There's, um, there's like an object store domain. So we, we have one called cedardev.o and that forms part of the URL. And then below that, there's a bucket. And then below that, all your objects are stored in a, as a, a flat. Uh, structure so there's, there's no there's no directory hierarchy oh yeah so um so the object store uh, is accessed over http um with an api to go with that and um, most object stores use amazon's s3 http api um so data is um is uploaded and downloaded using the http put and get operations um to get good performance, you can split your data across different objects. I'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, and then you can have two different levels of metadata. So the system level metadata, which is things like your um, access control and your um, and uh, the URL and um, yeah. And then there's also extendable metadata. So you can actually embed data about the, the um, object within the object itself. Um, and so that allows searching for data without opening the file. You can just query the, um, what's called the metadata server on an object store. And you can um, enable custom searches for user data. And access is controlled, is controlled by access keys and secret keys and also access control lists. And this gets over some of the limits you have on um, a POSIX file system with uh, access control, which gets quite complicated quite quickly. And you can run out of um, user, user uh, group IDs and so on. Um, okay, next slide, please, Papi. So to interact with an object store, um, you can. there's two ways. You can either upload and download your objects to a file system, which relies on you having a file system and is um, not the most efficient use of an object store, or you can stream in and out of RAM. And that's kind of like the preferred method of using an object store. It uses all the um, performance uh, properties of an object store much more efficiently. Um, so next, please, I'm gonna have to whiz through. So what does this mean for your workflow? So unfortunately, legacy applications are used to write into um, disk and they cannot read or write directly with an object store. So uh, the Jasmine object store, there's three different ways of using it currently. So you can use it prog programmatically and stream directly to and from an object store. So you can do that from within your analysis program. Uh, or you can use some more sophisticated libraries that can read and write directly to an object store. And those that we support or will be supporting on Jasmine are ZAR, X-Array, um, S3, NetCDF, Python, and um, cloud-optimized GeoTIFF. Um, but, and in the inter interim and for housekeeping, you can use the object store dynamically. So if you follow an analysis cycle similar to using data from tape where you retrieve it, analyze it, and then store it. And you can do this using simple tools like um, the mini up client or S3 command from Amazon. But um, this doesn't really use object stores to their advantage. And so one and two are much more preferred. Uh, next, please. So this is a quick programmatic example. Um, this is, you can 
it's probably better off looking at this later when the slides are available. But I'm just showing that you this is basically just streaming a file to uh, a very short string, in fact, a uh, text file in effect to the object store and then pulling it back and uh, printing it out. So um, next slide, please, Poppy. This is a bit more a more um, uh, involved example where um, it's got it's using a numpy array and then using a bytes IO object, which is um, essentially just like a file that's held in memory. So you can stream into that and uh, you can write into that, sorry, and then that bytes IO object is streamed straight up to the object store. So both of those examples, they don't they don't use any disk to interact with the object store at all. They're just um, using the functions built into um, a, a library called Boto3, which is a Python library provided by Amazon to interact with object stores and some of their other AWS services, but we only use the object store part of it. Um, okay, next please, Poppy. So as I said, there's more sophisticated tools, um, libraries to enable you to work a bit more effectively. And um, these communicate directly with the object store, so they, they don't need a cache or a working area. Um, the speed is comparable to um, as if you were writing across a network to a disk. Um, and then uh, with uh, large data sets, it's still important to checkpoint your analysis, I mean by that. So if you're doing a large analysis, it's a good idea to checkpoint it, as Ag talked about yesterday. But you, could do, you can do this to object storage. You don't need to rely on a local disk to do your checkpointing either. And the tools, they may allow the subdivision of data into smaller objects, which are sometimes called chunks, and that's to improve performance. And so currently at, op at CEDA, there are two options for this. There's X-Array and Czar, um, which is part of a Pangeo software stack, or there's some software we developed ourselves called S3 NetCDF Python. So next slide, please, Puffy. So X-Array and Czar, this is like a, a full analysis package, um, similar to things like Iris and CF Python, and it's for climate, but also other data like time series data and so on. So you can read multiple different file formats, including NetCDF. Um, it can read and write directly to object storage via um, an interface to ZAR that it has. So this can save arrays as ZAR stores. And that, uh, when you write to a ZAR store, it splits the array into multiple parts and chunks, as I mentioned before. Um, X-Ray and ZAR has plotting built in via matplotlib and cartpy. It can support parallel computing with Dask. So that's where you run an analysis on an array and it splits the array up into multiple parts and distributes it. And there's a piece of middleware called Dask, which uh, marshals all that for you. Um, so that, this is available on, supported on Jas Jasmine as part of Jaspi. And there's the uh, web address for it. Uh, next slide, please, Poppy. So um, S3 NetCDF Python, we developed that here at CEDA. Um, with help with funding from a. Sorry, no, you've got about two minutes. Yeah, that, that should be okay, thanks. Uh, with EU Horizon 2020 funding, and you can install this in user space uh, via a, a Python 3 virtual environment. You don't need to be sudo or root or anything to, to install it. Um, and so this is a direct replacement in terms of the interface for NetCDF or Python. So it's uh, completely com API compatible and you only have to change one line of code and that's your import statement. And this splits large NetCDF files into smaller uh, net, NetCDF files. So everything in S3 NetCDF, the smaller chunks are in themselves self-describing NetCDF files. Um, and so this just makes it very easy to, for housekeeping and to view your smaller chunks. Um, so, uh, by having the smaller chunks, you can have a faster access. You don't have to read the entire or stream the entire file. You just um, stream the part that your slice is interested in. Um, and you can define this chunk size yourself, or there's an algorithm that um, does an optimization based on the array size um, to come up with the size for you. So it reads and writes directly to object storage. It handles very large arrays, so many 
gigabytes or even terabytes in size and it has sophisticated memory management so that even if you only have a small amount of memory on your machine it will still allow you to handle these very large arrays and um, that's the github um, re repository location for it where you can download it uh, next slide please uh, poppy this is just a quick example i'll just flip through it it's basically just to show you that uh yeah that's fine uh, it, no it's okay poppy go go on thank you um and then the simple tools there's the mini or client and that kind of uh, replicates functionality of posix so there's lscp mvrm etc and then there's also s3 command from amazon which is has more features but it's also more complicated but as i said before they don't fully exploit the properties of object store um next slide please uh, how it ties in with other services so export object storage exposes the URL, the data at a URL rather than a file path. So you don't have to mount drives on different servers. And then it's so the data is accessible from the external cloud and cluster as a service as Matt was talking about previously. And um, within the next few months, we should be able to um, allow you to access the object store from compute facilities outside of Jasmine. And obviously this is subject to a firewall restriction, so we might have to whitelist your compute facility. Um, but also access restrictions is access control lists and keys and secret keys and so on. So I think the takeaway point is that object storage is much more suited to the cloud model of computing and um, we'll be using it a lot more in the future. Uh, thank you.